Today we will discuss about the modern philosophy, which is empiricism. The outline of our discussion is, the first one is the introduction and the second one is the highlights. For the highlights, we have the etymology of empiricism, history of empiricism, characteristics, well-known empiricists, implications to guidance and counseling, and connection of empiricism and guidance and counseling. Now we will come to the introduction. Empiricism is a theory of knowledge that asserts that knowledge comes only or primarily from sensory experience. Empiricism and the philosophy of science emphasizes evidence, especially as discovered in experiments. It emphasizes the importance of experience and sense of a perception as the source and basis of knowledge. It is associated on knowledge which is, the, which is the product of the experience. It is more concerned on scientific knowledge which are related to evidence, most especially the discovery of experiments. It highlights the role of experience and evidence, especially sensory perception, in the formation of ideas and argues that only knowledge humans can have is a posterior or based on experience. Let's come now with etymology. The English term empirical derives from the Greek word which is cognate with and translates to the, to the Latin experientia from which we derive from the word experience and the related experiment. The term was used by the empiric school of ancient Greek medical practitioners who rejected the three doctrines of the dogmatic school, preferring to rely on the observation of, pheno of phenomena. The term empiricism has a dual etymology, stemming both from Greek word for experience and from the more specific classical Greek and Roman usage of empiric, referring to the physician whose skill derives from practical experience as opposed to instruction in theory. The term empirical rather than empiricism also refers to the method of observation and experiment used in the natural and social sciences. It is a fundamental and requirement of the scientific method that all hypotheses and theories must be tested against observations of the natural world rather than resting solely on a priori reasoning, intuition, or revelation. Now we will come to the history of empiricism. The concept of tabula rasa or a clean state had been developed as early as 11th century by the Persian philosopher Avicenna, who further argued that knowledge is attained through empirical familiarity with objects in this world, from which one abstracts universal concepts, which can be then further developed through a syllogistic method of reasoning. The 12th, the 12th century Arabic philosopher Abu Aser or, demonstrated the theory of tabula rasa as a thought experiment in which the mind of a feral child develops from a clean slate through that of an adult in complete isolation from society on a desert island through experience alone. Here are the characteristics of empiricism. The first is empiricism emphasizes the role of experience and evidence, especially sensory experience, in the formation of ideas over the notion of innate ideas or traditions. The empiricism thesis does not entail that we have empirical knowledge. It entails that knowledge can only be gained, if at all, by experience. Here are the well-known empiricists. Aristotle. Aristotle was a Greek philosopher and polymath, a student of Plato and a teacher of Alexander the Great. Aristotle said that we gain knowledge by being affected by what we call the sensible form of things or sensory experience. Unlike Plato, Aristotle believed that what the senses reported was, more or less, the ultimate test of reliability that the visible world is the real world. The second one is Francis Bacon. 
He was an English philosopher, statesman, scientist, jurist, and author. Bacon conducted research on human beings, eagerness to selectively notice and remember events that confirm our beliefs. Once the foundation of modern science and idea of empiricism were laid down by Francis Bacon, other philosophers in the 17th century were then given the chance to elaborate on and advance the study and understanding of the human mind and behavior. We will come now to Jean Locke. He was a philosopher and physician recorded as one of the most influential of Enlightenment thinkers. He is considered one of the first of the British and Parisists following the tradition of Francis Bacon. He is equally important to social contract theory. His work had a great impact upon the development of epistemology and political philosophy. He maintained that we are burned without innate ideas, knowledge, is instead determined only by experience derived from a sense perception. Instead of knowledge being innate, Locke writes, all knowledge is founded on and ultimately derive itself from a sense of something analogous to it, which may be called sensation. He believed that human beings are bo born in total ignorance and that even our theoretical ideas or identity of identity, quantity and substance are derived from experience. In other words, Locke thinks of the minds as a blank slate or tabula rasa, just like Aristotle. John Locke was an empiricist in roughly the same sense that Aquinas was, and he set the tone for his successors. His new way of ideas, as it was called, has had, had has its purpose, to inquire into the original certainty and extent of human knowledge together with the grounds and degrees of belief, opinion, and assent. Locke wanted to assess the certainty of our knowledge as well as its extent. Let's now come with George Berkeley. Berkeley's main aim was to produce a metaphysical view which would show the glory of God. According to this view, there is nothing which our understanding cannot grasp, and our perceptions can be regarded as kind of divine language by which God speaks to us, for God is the cause of our perceptions. There exist, therefore, only sensations or ideas and spirits which are their cause. God is the cause of our sensations, and we ourselves can be the cause of ideas of the imagination. Let's come now with David Hume. Hume was a Scottish philosopher, historian, economist, and atheist, known especially for his philosophical empiricism and skepticism. Just as Locke followed in the footsteps of Francis Bacon in the helping to further develop empiricism and the study of psychology, so did David Hume. David Hume was a contemporary of Locke's who adopted his theory of ideas, but disputed them on the grounds that there was no perceptual experience that conveys the idea of self. According to Hume, the common sense of certainty of one's existence that Locke's promotes, proposes and calls intuitive knowledge does not exist and cannot be proven in terms of Lockean doctrine. Thus, he divided perceptions between strong and lively impressions or direct sensations and fainter ideas, which are copied from impressions. He developed the position that mental behavior is governed by custom that is acquired ability. He denied the existence of anything behind impressions and a cardinal point of his empiricism, to which he returned again and again, was that every simple idea is a copy of corresponding impression. Hume's main method in philosophy was that he called the experimental method. Let's come now with Jean Dewey. Dewey was an American philosopher, psychologist, and educational reformer. Although Dewey is known best for his publications concerning education, he also writes about many other topics, including experience, 
nature, art, logic, inquiry, democracy, and ethics. When the Dewey joined the newly founded University of Chicago, where he developed his belief in empiricism, he made four essays collectively entitled Thought and Its Subject Matter. Let, let us come now with Thomas Hobbes. He was born on the April 5th of 1588 and died on, the Decem on December 4, 1679. Hobbes was an English philosopher, best known today for his work on political philosophy. He also, like, he also, like Locke, stated that true revelation can never be in disagreement with human reason and experience. Let's come now with William James. He was an American philosopher and psychologist who has trained as physician. James held a worldview in line with pragmatism, declaring that the value of any truth was utterly dependent upon its use to the person who held it. Additional tenets of James' pragmatism include the view that the world is a mosaic of diverse experiences that can only be properly interpreted and understood through the application of radical empiricism. Let's come now with the implications to guidance and counseling. Guidance and counseling are very important in man's life. From the philosophical foundation, philosophical input has been chiefly in the areas of the emphasis on the worth of the individual and the, anal and the analysis of values as being absolute or relative. The goals that should be pursued, the role that the counselor should play, the techniques that could be employed, and the steps that must be taken must be based on such a philosophy and must then be part of the one's counseling philosophy. The connection of empiricism and guidance and counseling, the field of philosophy, like empiricism, has asked significant questions that led to the understanding of what human being is how he or she handled. This is why philosophy is very important foundation of guidance and counseling. Every counseling practitioner should have a philosophy of human beings and how their problems evolve in order to establish a philosophy of helping. Thank you very much.